for, for inviting me and I'm um, happy to be talking to you this morning for me, afternoon for you. So the question that I want to discuss today is um, raised in passing by Danielle Allen. Hang on, there we go. Um, in her book, Talking to Strangers, where she writes, democracy's basic term is neither liberty nor equality, but the people. But where and what is this thing, the people? How can one even hold an idea of the strange body in one's head? And here she's echoing a worry that John Dewey had about the nebulous nature of the public. So he famously wrote, if a public exists, it's surely as uncertain about its own whereabouts as philosophers since Hume have been about the residence and makeup of the self. So that the people, the public, the body politic, these are all ways of talking about the body that a government purports to govern. And in mass society, the public, in this sense, is smaller than all humankind, but bigger than everyone you know. And it's this intermediate scope of the public that gives rise to the question I wanna talk about today, which is what modes of mentality can we use to direct our minds toward the public? And the, the, this question is important to answer because uh, it relates to various problems, well-known problems for, for democracy. So if democracy is supposed to be governance by and for the people, the people, the democratic public is supposed to be empowered, but how are we gonna know if we're empowered if we can't even get our minds around this locus of empowerment? So what would be needed is a grasp of what self-governance would amount to, what common purposes or stakes might orient that governance, but that's exactly part of what's nebulous. So even people who might already have a concept of the people, the public, might need to feel the force of central ideas about it. For example, consider political rhetoric. So the kind of rhetoric that's designed to cultivate those powerful feelings that make political things happen. Feelings like conviction, loyalty, aggression, compassion, anger, joy, respect. These are all feelings that can make you feel connected to a leader, connected to other people who you've never heard of. Um, and Martha Nussbaum describes the, the political role of these feelings in her book, Political Emotions, when she writes, if distant people and abstract principles are to get a grip on our emotions, these emotions must somehow position them within our circle of concern, creating a sense of our life in which these people and events matter as parts of our own flourishing. So she's saying, if you're going to feel these things in a way that's directed toward the public, then somehow the public has to make its existence and, import and its importance felt. And the question is how that can happen. So I think this question about how we can direct our minds to the public is really a very fundamental problem that's actually at the basis of many very well-known epistemic challenges to democracy. And in that sense is you know, perhaps more fundamental than those challenges. So just to review those challenges, I find it useful to divide them into the externalist ones and the internalist ones. I'll just run through them very, very quickly. Um, so the externalist epistemic challenges concern external conditions, so institutions, mass communication systems, bad actors, um, any kind of anti-democratic political forces that can create epistemic conditions that anti-facilitate democracy. That's why they're anti-democratic. So for example, mass communication might be inadequate to inform the public about matters they're supposed to decide, um, disinformation or propaganda or poor journalistic practices um, can create appearances of controversy or uncertainty when really there should be none as we've seen happen in various cases, climate change, tobacco, so on. Um, the same sorts of practices can create, can cultivate intolerance uh, leading people to regard what should just be mere political opponents as, as existential enemies we see all over the world today. So those are all some externalist epistemic challenges to democracy. Then there are the longstanding internalist epistemic challenges, going back at least to Plato, who of course argued that some people just not that good at governance and so they shouldn't do it. After World War II, we had the growth in social psychology of the research program oriented around what they call the authoritarian personality, um, the idea that some people are just not that good at pluralism or toleration, um, you know, attitudes and dispositions that you need in democracy. And then today in political science, uh, we have a powerful set of challenges from Aiken and Bartels, um, who argue that some, maybe even most people, are not really that good at forming policy preferences prior to selecting preferences for leaders. So whereas the folk theory of democracy might have said people kind of walk around with preferences and ideas of 
what would be a good way to govern um, and then select leaders that represent those preferences actually in, in, in reality, they argue, um, you know, drawing on ideas that I think, you know, in effect began with Walter Lippmann and then the growing literature on political, on, on public opinion um, that said it was only ever something kind of constructed. Um, really, it's kind of the other way around. First, you identify with a certain leader and only then form policy preferences. So these are all uh, challenges to democracy that stem from one or another feature of people's minds as opposed to the external conditions I mentioned before. And to meet these challenges, both the internal ones and internalist ones and the externalist ones, one strategy for meeting them would be to cultivate a clearer grasp of what the public even is. So in the case of the external challenges, you could use that kind of grasp of the public to articulate values and principles that could guide policies surrounding those institutions I, I mentioned. And in the case of the internalist challenges, you could use the clearer grasp of what the public is to model what psychological dispositions would be like that would facilitate democracy, as opposed to the ones I listed that seem to inhibit it. So, to do both of these, to follow a strategy like this, you need more than just any old concept of the people. You need to feel the force of what the public is. So that's why it matters, uh, one set of reasons why it matters, what modes of mentality we can use to direct our minds toward the public. Now I've mentioned some reasons why it matters that come from concerns specific to democracy, but actually it's not just concerns about democracy or how to maintain it um, where these arise. Um, democracy can transition into or evolve out of political arrangements that are not democratic, that are even anti-democratic. So we could also ask what modes of grasping the public would stab off those declines of democracy or might hasten its emergence or its re-emergence. Um, so I think the question arises and matters for kind of any public in mass society. And the hypothesis that I'm going to be putting forward that I hope you can tell me what you think about it is that this mode in which people direct their minds to the public will greatly influence the extent of democratic culture and regime. Now, when we ask what modes of mentality we can use to direct our minds toward the public, of course, one possible answer is perception. We could ask, is it possible to perceptually experience the public? And that's the direction I wanna, that's the question I wanna be focusing on mainly. Is it possible to perceptually experience the public? So when I say, sometimes I'll just say, is it possible to perceive the public? And this is what I mean. Um, so perceptual experience here, though, is it's a phenomenological category, um, meaning that you could, you could perceive the public in this sense, even if you're having some sort of illusion, um, because what matters is that you, you feel like you're perceiving. Um, now, whether you're kind of actually perceiving, is it vertical, are things the way you experience them to be? Um, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. That won't stop you from having a perceptual experience of anything, including the public, if it's possible to perceive the public. So the, the distinction here that's most important is the distinction between um, perception and imagination, but what it, you know, experiences that feel like perception versus experiences that feel like imagination. And for those of you who are familiar with um, some debates in the philosophy of mind, um, there are debates where people are extremely occupied, and I've been occupied, preoccupied, I should say, too, in the past with a different distinction between perception versus cognition, and many distinctions in, in this vicinity. Um, but those don't really matter here uh, today. What matters here today are, um, uh, is the phenomenological distinction between experiences that feel immersively like perception, which is immersive, um, versus experiences that feel like imagination, where you feel like you're just kind of picturing something that's not actually there. Okay, now the standard view about whether it's possible to perceive the public in this sense is no, it is not possible. You can't perceive the public, you have to imagine it instead. So in that quote from Danielle Allen I began with, she goes on right away to answer the question she raises when she says, how can you even hold an idea of the strange body in, in one's head only with figures, metaphors, or other imaginative forms? And Walter Lippmann writing 100 years ago um, in The Phantom Public uh, made the case that uh, ordinary people can't really grasp what matters to the public because their basic epistemic position is just basically bewilderment. They have no idea what makes anything work. They have no idea what kind of thing uh, the public is. At most, they're just susceptible to manipulation um, by advertisers or people in political communication that might temporarily give them some sense of what a common interest is or something. But there's absolutely no way they sort of perceive the body politic as a thing that they can then think about as, you know, and ask questions like what are its common interests or what would be the best way to govern it. 
Um, so Wilt Littman and Allen are examples of two theorists who are especially interested in democracy and especially interested in American democracy. Um, but even thinkers who are not especially interested in democracy or American or even America especially um, also hold the standard view. So the political theorist Ben Anderson writing in the 80s proposed a definition of a nation on which it was an imagined political community, imagined as both inherently limited and sovereign. It's imagined in the sense that the members of even the smallest nation will never know most of their fellow members or even hear of them, yet in their minds lives the image of their communion. So here, this picture of a polity uh, of the public, it cross cuts all sorts of polities, democratic and otherwise. So it's, that's the standard view. You can't perceive the public, you have to imagine it. But I think it's fair to say that the standard view comes with a feeling of unease um, surrounding the idea that you have to um, rely on imaginative forms, symbols, myths, things that develop slowly over time in order to get your mind around the public. And the sense of unease arises because these things are so contingent. They can shift in meaning, they're fragile, they're unstable, they're always at a remove from lived experience. Whereas perceptual experience is by definition immediate and it's immersive it would be more powerful and less abstract and perhaps more effective of getting people to have a picture of the public. So it's not just theorists who may have a sense of unease about the fact that you can't perceive the public as they see it, you can only imagine it, but people who are actually, you know, forget about being theorists, if they're actually trying to develop a polity, they too might wish that there was some uh, more visceral direct way to get people's minds around the public. So compare hell. Compare hell. Hell is a polity. Um, if you wanted to make an argument uh, for avoiding hell, one thing you might try to do is not just give people some abstract principles about how you know it's really not a good idea. Things are going to be bad for you, or you're a bad person if you if you end up here. You might try to provide these kind of visceral, detailed depictions of what it would actually be like to experience this kind of hell, the eternal kind, as opposed to any sort of hell we might already be familiar with from being on earth. Um, and so by a similar sort of logic, you might think, well, if you wanted to make the case for a polity, if you wanted to make the case that somebody should feel they belong to a polity, perhaps be willing to make sacrifices for the polity, um, perhaps even risk their life for the polity, you might want to not just give them some abstract principles about democratic equality and equal respect, um, but more viscerally, give them some sort of detailed experience immersively of what it's actually like to be in the polity that casts being in the polity in a favorable light, just as these sorts of depictions cast being in hell in an unfavorable light. And you could even go one step better if you could do this in perceptual experience so that nobody can say, well, that's just a painting. Okay, so um, that's why you might sort of feel uneasy if the standard view is correct that you can only imagine the public, you can't really perceive it. All right, well, my conclusions that I'm gonna argue for are that the standard view is sort of correct in spirit, but incorrect in letter. And what I mean is that I'm gonna argue it is possible to perceive the public. So to that extent, the standard view is just wrong, but here I'm a slightly more tentative, but I think that I suspect that none of the ways there are to perceive the public really address the concerns that theorists, at least of democracy, have had about the need and the difficulty of making the public a live presence to the mind. So uh, what's needed to facilitate democracy are ways to cultivate a living sense of democratic politizenship. So politizens are people who share a polity Democratic politicians are people who share a democratic polity. I'm going to use those words instead of citizenship because it's not a legal category. Um, okay, so to understand, to facilitate, so that's why I think we need to find out the answer to this question, partly to facilitate democracy and partly just to understand political life so we can better recognize the kinds of perceptual experiences of the public that may anti facilitate democracy, or if there are any, the kinds of perceptual experiences that would facilitate. Okay, so here we go. That's my question. Is the standard view correct? Um, why I think the public can't be perceived? And in addressing this question, I'm actually going to distinguish two versions of it and discuss each of them separately. So one thing we could be asking when we ask, is it possible to perceive the public is, can you perceive the whole that is the public? So heard this way, the question is asking about, is it possible to perceive a certain type of multitude? the whole that is the public. Whereas a different thing we could be asking um, is whether it's possible to perceive 
people, you know, individual persons like you and me, can we perceive one another under a specific under, under the mode of presentation member of the same public as me? So in the multitude case, we're perceiving this, you know, somewhat strange entity, the public, the whole, some sort of multitude. Whereas in this mode of presentation version, we're asking about whether we can perceive one another under the mode of presentation member of the same public as me. So member versus multitude. I'll address both versions of this question, beginning with, uh, with the multitude one. Can the public as a whole be perceived? And we can start with what Dewey may have said about this question. So Dewey, of course, in the public and its problems, um, wrote a lot about what makes a public and arrived at the idea that the public is an aggregate of individuals. And when he asked what unity relation aggregates them together, his answer to that was a kind of causal relation. When we bear the indirect consequences of one another's actions, that makes us a public. And the public that we are becomes visible when we come to know about those indirect consequences. Now, if that's how you think about the public, then you might think, well, you could perceive the public making, you, one way to perceive the public would be to perceive the public making unity relations. Um, but Dewey's at pains to show that you can't do that. That's the whole problem. That's one of the problems of the public um, is that the indirect consequences aren't perceivable. Um, they have to be made visible. Um, and that need is at the foundation of various institutions, including um, journalism, which is supposed to help us see how we are connected to one another and which problems we have in common. Okay, now, so here's like a, a Dewey-esque argument um, that the public could become less nebulous if you could perceive its public making features, but you can't do that. And so at least that route to perceiving the public is blocked. And that's one line of thought that leads to the standard view. Now, schematically, Dewey, for all his emphasis on culture, was nonetheless thinking of the public as basically building up the big from the small. You build up society from individuals who are related in the right way. But you could ask, what if he had it backwards? And actually, the big inheres in the small from the start. And that was the view of the neo-Kantian uh, Georg Zimmel, who thought that the mind is structured already by preconditions for society, which he called social a priorities. I'll give you a feel for what he means by this reading a little quote from him. Societal unification needs no factors outside its own component elements, the individuals. It needs no factors. All you need are the individuals. Why? Because the consciousness of constituting with others a unity is all there is to this unity. This doesn't mean each member of a society is conscious of some abstract thing, a unity. It means he is absorbed in the innumerable specific relations with one another and in the feeling and the knowledge of being of determining others and being determined by them, the feeling and the knowledge of determining others and being determined by them. So here, we, so this might sound to you like some sort of kind of uh, built-in perception of social entity, and it's useful to compare it to um, the uh, condition on perceptual consciousness that A.D. Smith wrote about in his wonderful book, The Problem of Perception. So A.D. Smith was trying to uh, give a theory of what are the conditions for experiencing perceptually a world distinct from you. And he gave a list of various, actually three conditions. And one of them he called following Fichte, the Anstoß. So he, he's like, well, look, if you just press your finger down on a solid thing, um, you feel at this one and the same time, both your finger and like the table, the solid thing. So you experience in a single experience, both yourself and this, Thing that isn't yourself. Um, I hope you can see the echoes, hear the echoes of Fichte. And Zimmel saying exactly the same thing. Uh, we should think of him as describing the social Anstoß when he says, we experience ourselves always as a nexus between individuality and sociality. Neither strand has priority, neither is independent of the other. They form an experiential duality. And this happens from the first person perspective. It happens from the second and third person perspective, when we apprehend other people in like general social terms, we apprehend them both, for example, in terms of their roles, but also as themselves being a nexus of an individual and those social definitions. So this a priority, this thing we are equipped with in our mind from the beginning, equips us with an idea of society that's just built into our experience of ourselves and other people. So we could ask whether this gives us uh, perception of the public. Would the structure of our mind give us what we need to perceive the public and then show that actually the standard view is wrong? 
Well, I think it doesn't do that. Oh, it sort of, it almost does, but it doesn't because it's too general. What's imminent in the mind, according to Zimmel, is society as such, not this or that politically defined society specific to a time and a place. So even if the social as such uh, is a placeholder for political society in our minds, for all Zimmel says, you might have to supplement those preconditions he describes with more imaginative forms to get an idea of a specific public, which is of course just what the standard view says. So where things stand is Zimmel doesn't weaken the standard view. Dewey doesn't weaken the standard view. He may have been wrong to think the public is fundamentally an aggregate, um, but he's definitely right that you can't perceive the indirect consequences that our actions have of one another. Those things do have to be made visible. Okay, so the standard view is looking good so far, um, but let's consider some more arguments. Okay. Now, one very flat-footed, straightforward argument you may already even have thought of is that the reason you can't perceive the public is it's just too big. It is too big to fit in any sensory field. So some people not quite born yet, other people have passed. The people has this temporal extent that reaches beyond everyone's lifetimes. So basically not enough space to perceive the public, not enough time to perceive the public, and that's why you can't perceive the public. And that's why the standard view is correct. So that's okay as far as it goes, but it does have faith I think an important objection, which is that it's not true in general that you have to like see all the parts of something in order to see the whole. Um, you can experience, you can see a tomato without seeing the back of the tomato. Um, also the same thing with lemons, um, any object. So maybe the same point holds for the public. You could perhaps experience the public for all this argument says just by seeing only some of it. Now, who in European history had exactly this idea about the public? Robespierre, Robespierre. Robespierre, when he was concerned with this tension between sovereignty and representation, thought he could resolve the tension if legislators would only just be surrounded by the multitude, you know, surrounded by enough people they were legislating on behalf of that they could sense the presence of those they were representing. So this was his idea of proportionate publicity that legislators should make laws before a big crowd. And he had these very specific ideas about how big this crowd should be. So he was upset that the salle de manege and the Tuileries only had room for three to 400 people because he thought this crowd had to be actually 12,000 people. It would be better if the legislators did their legislating in like a big opera house or something. Now, there's all sorts of things you could ask Robespierre about why do you need this crowd and why does it have to be 12,000 people? So why you need it is he thought, well, if you just had this feeling of enough people before you when you're making laws, then it would be a check against corruption, intrigue and deceitfulness and so on. Um, popular surveillance would give legislators a sort of perceptual experience of, of the people. Um, so that's a, that's a contradiction of the standard view if it's true. Um, now, I don't wanna get too far into the questions you may have for Robespierre, like why do you need 12,000 people? Why do you need 12,000 people? Why don't you need just two dozen journalists or something like that? Um, but I'm gonna say that even just granting everything he's saying, it is true, technically, yes. I think this is a kind of counterexample to the, to the standard view if we just grant him that the legislators get an experience, the perceptual experience of the public. Um, so, okay. But the conclusion that Robespierre gets to, it doesn't really take us very far because at most, at most, it's an experience only on the part of the legislators. Who knows whether the people in this crowd also have an experience, perceptual experience of the public? Who knows if it can be leveraged into some democratic feeling? And how about all those people who aren't in the crowd, even if it's a crowd of 12,000 people? So I don't want to rest anything in my case against the standard view on Robespierre's point. I want to focus on a totally different sort of thing, which is the mob, the mob. So my hypothesis is the real reason the standard view is wrong, the most powerful case against it is because you can perceive a mob as a public and that's really why the standard view is wrong, at least in letter. So to make this case, I need to explain what's a mob, what kinds of mobs generate perceptions of the public and what does this do for democracy, this kind of perception? Okay, and my short answers, which I'll elaborate, are first, what's a mob? A mob is an open crowd with its own momentum infused with feelings of connectedness 
and an uninhibited disposition to violence, uh, what can make it seem like a public is that the feeling of connectedness it generate, generates is a feeling across heterogeneity and diversity um, that's directed violently against political opponents. I'll explain why that leads to a perception of a public. Um, and what is its relation to democracy? Um, it doesn't really, it, it is predicated on political inequality and in that way it does not facilitate democracy. Okay, so there are different ways of thinking about mobs. I'm focusing on an episodic mob, meaning the kind of thing that exists only as it's gathered. And that's different from talking about the mob in a dispositional sense, which some theorists do. Talking about the mob or one or another type of mob as a kind of standing political force. So, for example, Hannah Arendt, um, when she's talking about the mob, she's talking about it in the dispositional sense where she says, these are people who prefer mob rule to the rule of law. Um, du Bois has the idea of the culture of the mob. Um, at least Gooding Williams finds this in Du Bois, which combines um, elements of both the episodic and the dispositional. Um, it's related to the kind of explanatory use we, we, uh, we give to the concept of a mob and we say, you know, many black Americans migrated north in the early 20th century to escape the white mob. We're not talking about the white mob in a specific, about a specific episode, we're talking about a disposition. Um, and of course, mob is also used in pejorative ways uh, when you um, in, in certain kinds of political rhetoric that try to discredit a political movement by attaching mob to the end. So the Antifa mob, the Black Lives Matter mob, these are ways of talking about political movements that implicate, suggest that they have dispositions to violence. Then of course there are digital mobs, which may, you know, they're non-spatial, but perhaps they combine episodic and dispositional elements. Well, I'm talking about the episodic kind, just the very straightforward kind, that kind of episodic mob is going to be the thing that I think best can generate a perceptual experience of the public. The dispositional mobs, not so much. All right, so what's a mob? Now from now on, I'm just gonna say mob, but please understand that I'm talking about episodic ones. I think the best way to, um, to get our minds around what kind of thing a mob is, the kind of mob that would generate a perceptual experience of the public is to start with the great phenomenologist of crowds, Elias Canetti. So crowds, Kennedy hypothesized, um, and he was, it's an interesting book, Crowds and Power, because he doesn't cite anything, there's no data, um, there's not even any reference to other books, and yet this phenomenological, it's a phenomenological study, what is it like to be in various kinds of crowds, um, but it is clearly addressed to and synthesizing and drawing from a very long tradition of crowd theory, which he had clearly read, some in criminology, some in sociology. Okay, so here's one thing he writes when he's describing how crowds can free members of social distances and divisions. He writes, in that density where there is any scarcely any space between and body presses against body, each man is as near the other as he is to himself and an immense feeling of relief ensues. It is for the sake of this blessed moment when no one is greater or better than another that people become a crowd. So crowds generate a feeling of connectedness and open crowds, Kennedy hypothesizes, again, following a long tradition of crowd theory, um, where people, especially criminologists, worried about how crowds could become violent. They had a kind of um, potential for violent energy. Open crowds, the ones that aren't contained, like they're not in the Tuileries, they're not in an opera house. Um, an open crowd is just out in the open. They are energized, it is energized for violence, it's at the mercy of its own dynamics. And this is an important element of an episodic mob. So here again, Kennedy writes, it seems as though the movement of some people in the crowd transmits itself to others. So the urge to grow is the first and supreme attribute of the crowd. The natural crowd is the open crowd. There's no limits whatever to its growth. It does, so again, it's important that it's outside if it's gonna realize this um, potential, this energy for violence. It does not recognize houses, doors, or locks, and those who shut themselves in are suspect. Okay, so, um, an open crowd is, may look heterogeneous and visibly diverse because it's gathering people as it moves, but from the inside, it feels unified. And that's part of what's so exhilarating about it. A great relief ensues, as he says. And this in a way gives us our first clue to how an episodic mob as a certain type of open crowd could give you an experience of the public. It has this phenomenology of that intermediate scope that's bigger than everybody you know, but smaller than everybody in the world. Okay, so mobs realize the open crowd's potential. And 
you know, there's certainly a way of hearing Kennedy and for that matter, his predecessors in crowd theory, it's, it's certainly a way of hearing them as talking in this kind of, you know, almost metaphysical sounding way about the crowd as an entity that has its momentum and has its own movements and somehow can seem hypostasized into a thing that a logical individualist might roll its eyes at. But the idea that crowds have a potential for violence, there's certainly something to this idea, which you can see from the fact that we have this concept of crowd control, um, the potential for mass violence and disorder in a crowd is well recognized. Um, there is such a thing as group level momentum, however exactly we'd like to theorize about it. So mobs, episodic mobs, the kind that, episodic mobs, the kind that can generate a perceptual experience of the public, I'm gonna argue, what they do is they realize this energetic violent potential of an open crowd. So a mob is an open crowd that loudly manifests this feeling of connectedness and realizes violent potential. Okay, so here we have the first features of a uh, mob, an open crowd with growing momentum directed toward violence that generates feelings of connectedness across social divisions and dis distances. Okay, um, and here's an example that we all have just lived through of the feeling of connectedness that's across a visible heterogeneity. So in the United States on January 6th, that particular mob it was a kind of amazing mix, if you think about it, of people who are old and young, there were anti-Semites, there were Orthodox Jews, there were rich people, there were much less rich people, there were men, there were women, there were working people, unemployed people, costumed people, uncostumed people, people in favor of law enforcement, people against law enforcement, people whose minds are probably changeable, people whose minds are pretty recalcitrant. In other words, it was an incredibly diverse crowd of the US right. Okay. And it did to them feel like a public. I'm just giving you a little clip from an article that came out a few days ago that emphasizes this, um, emphasizes this heterogeneity. Um, and I'm, I said it feels like a public. What I meant to say was it, uh, it was visibly heterogeneous. A ragtag army in mismatched colors, the orange knit caps, the proud boys, the green camouflage jackets, the red and white blue shirts, and so on, blah, blah, blah. Um, so uh, just to make it vivid, because you probably already have this image in your mind, so we might as well use it um, to make this point. Okay, now what can make a mob feel like a public, um, given the features that it already had, that I've already mentioned it having? Well, um, it can feel like a public, I'm going to argue, when it specifies this political direction for the violence. So, so far, if you just think of how Kennedy describes the open crowd and, you know, define a mob as a certain type of open crowd that just has, by virtue of being an open crowd, a disposition to violence, what can make it feel like a public is if you then specify a political direction for that violence, a felt enemy that it's explicitly defining and asserting itself against, um, so that it's destructive energies can be marshaled against a political opponent, um, bracketing the constraints of law and respectable society and social boundaries. Um, that's one thing that I think can make it feel like a public. And here, the important thing uh, is that it's the people are feeling like they're constituting a public, not that they're appealing to a public or appealing to the rest of the public. That would be saying, you know, we are part of a public and we're addressing somebody else who also belongs to the public in order to make a certain case that a principle has been violated or that a practice is wrong or that we really need a different kind of political arrangement or something like that. It's different with a mob because they're not appealing to anything. Um, they are claiming to constitute a rightful public. So this goes beyond just addressing a public, goes all the way to enacting what they think they're entitled to. So the difference is between having an experience that you already constitute a public versus addressing public. Okay, and now here's just some more quotes from people who are at January 6th that seem to express this feeling of, of constituting already the rightful public. This is our house, you said, we own it. Um, the building belongs to us, et cetera. Okay, um, so the social identity that's given this kind of visceral definition by its fight against the supposed existential threat, um, it does something to one's sense of political agency if you're participating in the mob, which is that it finally at last makes concrete the idea that you are actually exercising some political agency. Um, and you know what more could what what more concrete example of political agency could there be than breaking down the door of a political building? Okay, so what I'm saying is that the mob can kind of perceptually manifest what might otherwise just stay abstract. 
So due to the momentum of the crowd, the consequences of togetherness are suddenly palpable, as opposed to what Dewey's describing, where we're all sort of infecting one another, but it's also nebulous how that happens. We need writing and discussion and deliberation and things that happen over a long time scale to make that visible to us. Well, here, you don't need any of that. Um, the consequences of togetherness are made concrete. Um, and then contra Lippmann, one is not bewildered about what one's agency or role is in political life, uh, the epistemic distance from politics appears to be closed. Okay, now it's obvious, I think, that all of these perceptions of the public that are arise from the sort of mob I'm describing involve illusions, illusions of all of several kinds of illusions. So the mob isn't the whole polity. Any political agency is limited in its temporal scope. You only have this kind of agency while it's happening. Um, and it's also limited in the kinds of things you can do. Basically, you can just break stuff, but um, that's only one thing. Um, social distances can't be removed just by gatherings. So they don't actually go away. So that's another illusion. And of course, perhaps the most important one is that political opponents usually don't constitute an existential threat. So I think all of these illusions are captured in Hannah Arendt's remark that the mob is a caricature of the public. Okay. Now, Kennedy emphasized the feeling of equality that was so appealing, that's so appealing to being in a crowd. Um, so an illusion of equality here is that a mob can seem to constitute a kind of political equality as, as an effect Kennedy predicted. Um, it seems to give you an illusion of self-governance. Um, a roving open crowd moving through space it claims as its own can give a distinct impression of the people, the people's will concretized at last. And then, as I mentioned, it gives an illusion of political agency. You know, uh, a barrier that's permeable seems to be weak and therefore you seem to be strong. Okay, so the standard view is false, I think most clearly shown to be false by episodic mobs. That's a very clear case of perceiving the public. Um, but obviously um, it's not, you know, if the standard view is false, uh, it might be false, but if the spirit behind the standard view was really at least in the hands of the democratic theorists, if the spirit behind the standard view was at least if you want to facilitate democracy, if you want to facilitate political equality, not just among the mob, but real political equality um, with its proper scope, uh, if you want to facilitate that, perception can't do that. So that's what I want to spend the rest of the time thinking about. Is that true? All right. Now, I've been talking about perceiving the whole public perceiving the multitude. And I've argued that yes, that is possible through the mob. Um, but how about this other sense of the question I mentioned before? Is it possible to perceive um, somebody as a member of the same public as you? Um, is that kind of perception of the public possible? So now I'm gonna argue that, yeah, that is also possible. Um, and my example of this is gonna be what I'll call partisan perception. So one dimension of polarization as we're all familiar with is that our political affiliations come to be expressed as identities. That's one, as opposed to just things we believe or things we happen to be committed to. Um, now, a partisan, whether it's the person, you know, the same partisan as you, the, uh, a partisan that you identify with or, or someone you don't identify, or a partisan set of positions you don't identify with, either way, they're a member of your public. So if you can perceive somebody as, um, if you can perceive someone as belonging to having the same set of, of political positions that congeal into identi an identity as you, um, then that would be a kind of partisan perception. And so would, it, so would it be partisan perception if you perceived somebody as a anti-partisan, it's like the other, the other kind of identity. Here, the public would be crowded out by this more specific category. So let me just give you some concrete examples. Um, I like the observation that Robert Talese makes in, in uh, his recent book, where he, he says one result of one dimension of political polarization, at least in the US, is that the social spaces we occupy become colonized by categories, allegiances, and divisions of politics. We're nearly constantly communicating our politics to one another. That's what colonizes our social spaces. And of course he has in mind the huge literature on social sorting. There is some controversy about the scope of these things, but um, I think even the common ground among the people, the political scientists who disagree about the scope, they agree that it's not just that there are certain cues like where you buy your coffee or whether you drive a hybrid car versus a pickup truck or whether you wear yoga pants that can predict um, which uh, party in American politics you might vote for. It's not just that 
these are correlations. It's that people actually use these cues in making immediate judgments about people they see, even if they don't know. So that if you like see someone um, buying coffee at Starbucks or carrying a tote bag or wearing yoga pants, um, that you um, you reach the judgment that they're likely to be, you know, voting for, if they're going to vote at all, voting for the Democratic Party. You, people can form these guesses from things that have nothing to do with politics. They have nothing to do with political positions, like whether you wear yoga pants, whether you have art versus clocks on your wall, that people nonetheless integrate this information in their judgments about others, their immediate judgments about others, which is why it's kind of social perception. Now, when we talk about moral perception, we're talking about the idea that you could perceive somebody, there is this debate in moral philosophy and the philosophy of perception about whether there is such a thing as moral perception. And one strand of this debate concerns whether it's possible to perceive somebody as worthy of respect, deserving concern, um, and basically a kind of equal moral sub to you. Well, um, you could also define and have a similar debate about immoral perception. Is it possible to perceive somebody as affording disrespect, as deserving harm or pain or misfortune? Um, and in a context, a highly polarized environment, um, partisan perception is not just a matter of perceiving someone as likely to vote for this or that party, um, but it's infused with affect. It's not just like some sort of cold fact, it's infused with affect. And with affect comes aversion, um, potentially, when you don't share an affiliation. So you could see partisan perception at an extreme as a kind of immoral perception, sort of the opposite of moral perception. Um, partisan perception would become a way of sorting the legitimate public from the anti-public which kind of seems a little bit like a small scale mob, not minus the violence, but when you ask, well, is it possible to perceive the public? Um, partisan perception under polarization would be like the mob is a way of um, perceiving someone as being a member of the same um, public as me, either in a way that's infused with a sense of, you know, on the, on the right side or on the wrong side. Okay, now, um, so it seems like there's a pattern and some people might say, this is kind of just what we should, well, not that we should, not that we should expect it, but, it, but some people would find in this idea of, of you know, perception of the public only coming in this sort of anti-democratic form, they would find the idea that was voiced by Walter Benjamin in 1939 when he talked about the aestheticization of politics, the aestheticization of politics, which he associated with fascism. And some theorists of fascism, um, here's Federico Finkelstein, articulate this idea, Benjamin's idea, by saying, fascist practice focused on a set of political rituals and spectacles aimed at grounding its politics and lived experiences. These practices present fascism as something that could be seen. So partisan perception is sort of like a small scale spectacle, like Talis says, we're constantly communicating our politics to one another because it's colonized social spaces. All right, so, um, um, so what I would like to know is in what ways could perception be a locus of political efficacy? Now, I've argued that it can be, unfortunately, uh, in the case of a mob, a locus of political efficacy, um, and, but, I want to distinguish between, um, you know, so it's one thing for it's one thing for there to just be perceptions of the public in one or another of the multitude way or the member way. Um, but it's another thing for those perceptions to leverage or marshal or add to change the political situation, like amplify or enforce it or something. So here's an important distinction I think we should draw. Um, if you like, if if we're friends, I could probably perceptual experience you as my friend, but we didn't get to be friends by perceiving each other. We got to be friends by talking and doing things together. So if we can perceptually experience someone as a friend, we could probably also perceptually experience them as like a fellow democratic politician. Um, but if these perceptions of one another as, as fellow democratic Clitizens are just merely exploiting a pre existing set of attitudes we have, kind of like in the friendship case, then the perception that we may have of one another as fellow democratic politicians is not really a locus of further political efficacy. It's more a reflection of something that's already happened. Um, so it's not much, to, it's not really facilitating democracy as much as it might be reflecting it. Um, 
Okay, whereas mob-induced percept mob perceptual experiences seem to do both. They seem to both exploit some antecedent sense of who the rightful public is, but also they seem to add to it. Um, and in that sense, the mob-induced one at least is a locus of political efficacy. Um, you know, the mob-induced perceptual experience takes a feeling of this nebulous public and suddenly makes it concrete. So it adds to something, it amplifies, clarifies, energizes and mobilizes it, reassures and strengthens and gives further definition to a supposedly rightful public. Um, and the question I have is whether fascist political culture, which so clearly does martial perception for political efficacy, is that the only kind that does that? Does fascist political culture somehow have a monopoly on perceiving the public? Um, well, I'm a little bit afraid that it might, but I have I I, I want to hear what you think about this. So I'll just make the case that it does, and then you can you can come back and tell me if I'm missing something. So um, you know, is there any way to leverage perceptual experience for democratic culture? And I'm telling you up front that I kind of suspect there isn't, um, but I think I might be you know, departing from some political theorists who have thought otherwise. So I'll just mention uh, Nancy Rosenblum and, and Mark Steers, who put a lot of emphasis on kind of democratic significance of the casual chat. So Mark Steers' recent book called Out of the Ordinary, where he focuses on this. Rosenblum, of course, has written a lot about um, the reassuring role that these sorts of kind of chatting with somebody casually at the ATM machine can play in a context where there's a lot of precarity in a neighborhood, for example. Um, so perhaps this is a way of perceiving somebody as member of the same public as me in a way that would actually leverage the perception for truly democratic purposes. And my worry about the strength of the, the significance of these sorts of interactions is that they lend themselves easily to compartmentalize. So you could have, I'm reminded of an anecdote that I heard from the journalist Sarah Kinzier about chatting with somebody in line uh, waiting to go to a Trump rally. She went to the rally to check it out and had this lovely chat with another lady in line. And, you know, the chat was great. Um, it was one of the kind of chat that Rosenblum would say can really reassure someone that we are having these kind of democratic attitudes of, of respect and just that level of concern that's not exactly, you know, friendship in the ordinary sense, but it's not indifference and certainly not aggression. Um, and yet, then this person goes into the Trump rally and is just as prone to mob violence as many of the other people are there. Okay. Um, so there's kind of the worry that I'm wrapping up soon, that if a way of perceptually experiencing the democratic public is somehow neutral between these intense interests or enemies, then focusing on it's just not going to have that mobilizing feeling. It's not going to play anything like the role that those depictions of hell played in arguing that this is really a place you'd like to avoid. Um, whereas if it does become specific enough to mobilize and impact your attitudes, perhaps it will just only ever be partisan or worse. That's the worry. Now, um, I focused on I focused on perceptual experiences of the public that actually involve illusions. So I spent a bit of time going through the various illusions involved in the mob generated perceptual experience. And it's certainly a good question that may have occurred to you already to ask like, well, aren't there any kind of non illusions? Aren't there just kind of veridical, correct, accurate perceptual experiences of, of democratic, uh, a democratic polity? Um, so I've mentioned, I mentioned the casual chat already, um, but you might think, well, can't we just take some sort of scene that is a scene of practicing political equality, like, in, like voting or having a town hall meeting or something, and then just consider a perceptual experience of that scene? Wouldn't that be a kind of straightforward perception of the public um, in one or another of these senses, the member or the multitude, um, that would not have this character that um, Benjamin talked about when he talked about the aestheticization of politics. So I'm just going to mention some candidates for this, and then I'll wrap up. OK, so what about the town hall? Um, and I'm thinking, well, you can perhaps have an experience of, of it in the, in the way you could experience your, you have a perceptual experience of your friend that's exploiting pre-existing feelings or attitudes. Um, the reason I don't think it will play a kind of leveraging role as a kind of locus of political efficacy is because, you know, famously, people have very little agency in voting. It's like you have to convince them that it counts, you know, like it's like this is just my vote, but there's all these other people and so on. Um, you could try, and of course, people have, have suggested this. In fact, Danielle Allen herself has suggested to, uh, in the United States to make 
to make Veterans Day, uh, you know, voting is a holiday. You don't, you know, businesses are closed. It should be full of joyful rituals so that we can celebrate the joys of self-governance. Okay, that seems like a great idea to me, um, but it doesn't seem to involve a perception of the public. It seems to push us back to the standard view where precisely by making a ritual and, and fusing it with symbols and so on, we're saying you have to imagine the public. It's not just something you straightforwardly perceive. Okay. Now, I, um, I actually had a chance to talk about this material with some people and giving the talk a few other times and somebody mentioned, and I'll confess, taught me what a mosh pit was. They're like, what about the mosh pit? What about the mosh pit? Isn't that kind of a perception of the public that's actually very democratic? Um, and once I learned what a mosh pit was, I realized, okay, this would be a very small, it's not really a public, it's not a body politic, it's too small scale, um, but I can see why they thought of that because it's sort of not exactly a mob and yet it has these sort of feelings of connectedness as well. Um, what about a nonviolent mass protest? I mean, way I meant to uh, speak to this before when I was talking about the difference between appealing to a public with a message as opposed to claiming to constitute it. The best candidate, I think, for a democratic perception of the public would be perceiving not so much people, but the built environment in one or another way. So affordances in public spaces, like the empty park bench that anybody could occupy, or painted bike lanes that show that somebody might come here on, you know, somebody might be in the space and you hear, hear and, and you could be nudged toward looking out for them. And interestingly, these sorts of perceptions are not direct perceptions of people. There are perceptions of places where people could be, which you might think kind of puts it at one remove from perceiving the public. It's like you're perceiving a polity without perceiving anybody in the polity, just kind of the background condition of the polity. But that absolutely deserves, I think, a lot more thought and discussion. And Bernardo Zacca has written some really interesting things about that in the volume he edited on uh, political theory and architecture the question of how much can the built environment of perception, how much can it do to cultivate politicianship, democratic politicianship? Um, so my tentative conclusions are that, my, my non-tentative conclusion is that it's absolutely possible to perceive the public so the standard view is wrong. My somewhat more tentative conclusion is, I don't kind of doubt there is any way to leverage at least person perception for cultivating democratic politicianship. Um, if we want to make people get their minds around the public in a way that will actually facilitate democracy, that's going to live far more in relationships of doing things together than in actual scenarios of person perception. Okay, so I'll stop there. <laughs>